My name is Bradley Schaefer, and uh, I'm also known as Soul Cutter all around the internet, so on GitHub, Twitter, pretty much anywhere I can reserve the name before somebody else gets to it. Um, <laughs> so that's most places. Uh, I'm also on the RSpec core team, uh, so I know a lot about testing, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk with anybody about that stuff. And uh, I work at Stitch Fix, and we're hiring. Uh, we're a distributed team. They're based in uh, San Francisco, uh, but they have people all across the country. I actually uh, come to you here from Cleveland, uh, although I grew up in Indiana, so <laughs> I have some Indiana credibility, I think. Uh, but that's, that's not really what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'm here to give this talk called Metaprogramming with Superpowers. So, do you see what I did there? <laughs> Super, that's like a, a Ruby keyword. So, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, thanks for that. So, when I started writing this talk, uh, with, with all great ideas, I first go to Twitter. So, I, I asked my Ruby friends, what do you think about metaprogramming? Um, and by the way, I am pretty sure nobody in this room responded to that tweet, so I'm, I'm Soul Cutter on Twitter. <laughs> if you want to follow me, my follower count's pretty low, so I need to like self promote a little bit. <laughs> so I got I got a bunch of responses, and uh, so I'm going to share some of them with you because I think they're fairly representative of the community at large. So my two cents: the less you can have, the better. Metaprogramming is most of the time a bad design, abstraction, way of working. It's pretty negative, all right? Uh, there are solid use cases, but too often it's just another form of cleverness that overcomplicates code unnecessarily. Depends. If you mean DSLs that create callable objects, good. If you mean code writing more code, bad. Uh, and, and Nick Sutter is the author of the Trailblazer-like framework on top of Rails. Uh, I, I was actually pretty interested by his response there because it's pretty nuanced and uh, I'm surprised he wasn't a little bit more enthusiastic, I guess, but uh, I guess that's how it goes. Uh, but my favorite response was this one, which is more along my lines of thinking, which is, uh, my answer is that metaprogramming, if you include the whole object model that makes it possible, is the best thing about Ruby, hands down. So. I definitely am on board with that. I think one of the best things about Ruby is the ability to uh, metaprogram, and it's what makes Ruby expressive and fun to write. And Ruby is a, a programming language that's optimized around developer happiness, so this is like a core part of that, in my opinion. But I will say that this talk is not here to change your minds about metaprogramming, so Keep that in mind also. Um, oh, that reminds me. Sorry, I haven't practiced this, but one thing I wanted to mention up front is uh, the abstract for this talk uh, had a lot of parallels to Rails, and I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff because this talk did not get accept, uh, accepted to RailsCon, so screw those guys. Um, so th there's, not, there's not much to talk about Rails, but there is still talk about it. So you might be thinking at this point, like, what is metaprogramming? So a lot of different people have different definitions of what that means. I think it's a surprisingly fuzzy idea. So some people say that it's code that writes code, um, which is an interesting way to think about it. It's, I think, partially correct. Uh, but there's, I think, also other aspects of metaprogramming, like the ability to reflect upon code that is written. So being able to inspect objects at runtime to see uh, the different properties that are on them, such as methods or constants and things like that. And then on top of that, manipulating them is also you know, the icing on the cake. It's nice to be able to do that. But if you can't actually reflect on things, then metaprogramming would be really hard also. Um, so, so I count it as that whole area of programming. So being able to modify uh, what the code does at runtime, to me, is metaprogramming. So nice. for this talk, I spent a lot of time on this slide, by the way. Um, 
I'm, I'm really bad at graphics and stuff. But uh, this talk is going to go over an example of a meta programming that I actually did in a project. And it's kind of going to, I hope, give you some tools in order to make any meta programming that you attempt better, but also perspective on how you can write things using meta programming uh, that people won't just automatically hate. Uh, or, alternately, you might see some things in this talk, and when you run across them in real code, maybe they'll be a little bit more obvious what they're doing, so you don't have to be like, ah, this is scary metaprogramming, and I don't know what it's doing. So the example that I'm going to talk about is, I used to work for a consulting company, and one of our clients was called Dixon Data, and they sell temperature and humidity loggers uh, that are connected to the internet. And um, basically these are kind of like internet of things devices. And they are constantly sending temperature and humidity like every five minutes or every one minute or however they're configured pardon me, uh, across the internet to the service. So that's the, the context of, of the problem that we're going to be talking about. So the code that I'm going to show you is not really from this project, but it's a pretty good example of code from this project. Um, but this is written years, like I wrote this talk years later, and this is kind of just from memory. Um, so it's a little bit contrived in that way, but it is representative of real code. I hope you can see that. Uh, so just to start out with, like, there's going to be this constant throughout all these examples, UTC. It's just the active support time zone for UTC. It's that object. Uh, you can ignore whatever this is from, from here on out, but, uh, you know, we have to start from humble beginnings, I guess. Uh, so within this application that's collecting temperature and humidity, uh, there's a concept called data points. So this is basically the core time series data that these devices are collecting. And they're is a property of data points that there is the timestamp or data point TS. Uh, I'm going to use the abbreviation TS throughout because timestamp is a really long word. <laughs> um, and I can't type that much. So there's a data point timestamp, which is the time that this temperature was recorded. Uh, and within the code, it's actually stored as a Unix timestamp, which is the number of seconds since some random date in 1970. Uh, that's, it's, it's used in everything. So if you're not familiar with it, just Google Unix timestamp and it's great explanations. Uh, but it's stored as seconds since whatever that date in 1970 is. And we don't really like dealing with those times uh, as, as that gigantic number. So throughout the code, we have these conversion methods that read the, the timestamp and parse it into a time zone so that it's like, a first class time object with a zone. Uh, and there's a lot of different classes that do this actually, like data point is one of them, but we within this application are dealing with timestamps all over the place. So another example is a chart annotation. So those nice charts that uh, you saw on that device, you're able to like mark, oh, I open the refrigerator door on that chart or whatever, and you make an annotation at a certain timestamp. Uh, so they need a way of both saving and representing that too. So you can see that throughout the code, there's a lot of duplication around this idea of converting timestamps into uh, first class time objects. So I was feeling clever and I was like, I'm gonna metaprogram my way around this. Um, maybe not best first instinct, but <laughs> there we go. So uh, th this was my first attempt. So. You know, we're, we're, here we are metaprogramming already. So I, I created this module that gives you a method called timeify. It takes an attribute and it defines a method uh, that is the at attribute, whatever that is, and it, it does that conversion for you. So now that we have this module, we can extend it in our various classes and call timeify data point TS, and we no longer need to write that method. Like, this is writing the method for us on the data point class. So we, we took that three lines and turned it into two lines, um, which is, I guess, a win? 
Um, in, in all honesty, this is a contrived example. There's more in, a, in the realistic example, like there's more going on in there, but um, for, for our purposes, this is fine as an example. So now we have this instead, and you know, what do you think? Is it pretty good? Better? Maybe? No! This is <laughs> unacceptable! Oh. Uh, so this, I think, is why people hate metaprogramming. So, okay, you know, looking at this, yeah, we solved the problem, but, and, and we kind of understand how we did that because we wrote this module, but there's a lot of problems with this approach. So if you're reading this code for the first time and you come across timeify data point TS, you're like, okay, that's timeify, that's a verb, kind of. Um, it's doing something to- Unacceptable! <laughs> yes, unacceptable. I wish I had that voice. Actually, I should I should put that embedded. Uh, anyway, so yeah, what is it doing to the data point timestamp? Like when you read this, you cannot tell what is going on. You're just like it's doing something, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, and then throughout the code, you might notice that there's this data point at method that people are using all over the place. And like, where did that come from? Like. You know, you can take an educated guess and be like, I guess Timeify must be doing that. But like, you're not sure. Like, it's not clear from this interface that that's what's going on in any way. Uh, and on top of those two things, which are kind of pointing out how unreadable it is, uh, there's also a subtle problem in being able to override the data point add method. Like, with this approach, you just can't actually do that. So, so these are all like real problems, I think, with this approach. Even though we solved this problem, we created more problems. Uh, and, and that's why people would come across this and be like, why did he do this? This is dumb. I'm probably going to unwind this and back it all out so, just so people can understand what the code's actually doing. And I would totally get that. Um, by the way, in the real application, this is totally what the solution I ended up with and where I stopped. So I've had some time to let this like marinate, and I'm like, that was bad, and I should feel bad. Um, but I totally can understand how people get to this, this point and think that they're done. But I think that we can make some improvements. Like, we can address these problems. So my second attempt, uh, it's gonna make some pretty modest changes, I think, to what we're doing here. And the, the main thing I want to address with these changes is using uh, what's called the principle of least astonishment, which has a lot of different definitions, but the, the favorite one that I found was that people are a part of the system, the design should match the user's experience, expectations, and mental models. So the idea is that if people already have expectations or, or mental models that your approach would fit into, like you should totally piggyback on that. Like you should use that in order to make this code look familiar to people. Um, because code is, I mean, yes, it's also executing on the computer and it's important that it works, but it's also read by people and people need to be able to understand it if they're gonna work with it. So, second attempt, uh, I made some changes. So here you can see that first thing I did was I changed the name of this module, so it's no longer Timeify. Uh, I realized that that is completely meaningless to anybody and doesn't fit into anybody's mental model of what that could possibly be doing. Uh, so instead, I chose the name Time Attribute Methods, which I think uh, it is pretty communicative. So uh, methods, you know that this module is a bucket of methods. Uh, okay, so maybe that's a little abstract, but uh, time, so this is dealing with, uh, with time stuff. And then attribute, I think, is kind of the, the key unlock of this naming where it's like, ah, attributes, these are things that we work with in Ruby all the time. So we have adder reader, adder accessor, adder writer. These are like well understood concepts to most Rubyists, I think, hopefully. Uh, if not, you should read up on those because they're good. So that, that's just an easy renaming change, but I also changed the name of the method and how you invoke it. 
So one key thing that I thought was important is instead of the verb timeify, I chose the name time reader because that's kind of uh, mirrors the atter reader um, or attribute reader uh, naming convention. Uh, and since that's a noun now, I thought it was important for the first argument to be the actual method that it's going to define on this class. Uh, because that's how uh, attribute readers work, and that's, I think, what people would expect. But there's still more configuration that needs to go into this because I think it's important for people to know where it's getting the information for, for this reader. So I used a keyword argument uh, called from so that you can define where that comes from. So not only is that far more explicit and readable, but it also gives you more configurability because with the old way, you are depending on a naming convention that something is going to be named underscore TS and your new method is going to be named underscore at and that's just kind of how it works. But with this way, you could name things any way you want and you could still be using Time Reader and uh, it wouldn't throw you for a loop at all. So that was the first, uh, or my second attempt, but first pass at making improvements to this. And yes, it's better now. So achievement unlocked. I play a lot of games. Um, so that was good and all. So now as look, but I, I started uh, bringing this across to more and more of the classes uh, within this system. And I came across a case where we have alarm events. And alarm events aren't like data points. There's not just one time that's associated with them. There's actually a start time and an end time. And I realized that there's actually a little bit of a wrinkle with end times because not all alarms have actually ended yet. So there could, could be alarms that are going off right now because the temperature is too high, it exceeded some threshold. Or, or whatever it is. So if that alarm is still going off, we don't have a timestamp stored for when that alarm ended. So for the purposes of displaying it, we need to show something on a graph um, because it can't just like go off the edge of the screen and uh, keep on drawing. Uh, and there's a, a lot of different places where I can handle this, but in this code, we were handling it by checking if the end timestamp was nil and saying that, oh, if we don't have an end time, then now is the end time, because that's the end of the chart, it's right now. So I tried to override the method that we created with the time reader, end at, and I found out that, like, what do, you, what do you think happens when I call this method? Anybody? Not quite. So it should be. Um, at some point, but actually what happened was you get a no method error. Um, so in our method we're calling super, but there's no super class method to end at for alarm event, blah, blah, blah. So what does this mean? So if I, I just want to walk through a little bit of how this current uh, incarnation of time attribute methods works. So we call a time reader. This code is defining a method now called endAt, takes a time zone, and within the block there, it's uh, defining the, the body of the method, and, and that's what the time reader does. And then what we do next is we define endAt. So this definition of endAt is essentially at the same level on that class as the definition that was created by a time reader. So what happens in a class when you do that is the second method just overwrites the first method. That, that first method is just gone now. You can't reach it. Uh, in Rails, they used to do a thing that may, I might be showing my age here, but there used to be this alien method, alias method chain thing that people would do in order to make those previous things accessible. But pe that's considered bad to do now, and it's not a part of Rails, I don't think. Uh, I think they wrote that out finally. So like we don't do that anymore, but like we're overwriting this method and calling super, and there's nothing in the ancestry of the class that defines the endat, so it can't find any implementation, and it's just lost. So we can't do this. This is a problem with our, our current metaprogramming approach. 
So, I'm a programmer. I feel like there's got to be a way to solve this. So I went back to the drawing board and decided, okay, I'm not giving up on this metaprogramming. Uh, it's, it's too nice to have this. I've got to figure out a way to make this work. So I did some reading, figured out, okay, here's a way to do this. And now this code is starting to get a little bit funky, I think you see. Um, but what I did here was rather than defining the method on the class, I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to create this whole new module and define it, define this method on the module, and then I'm going to include it in the class. Like, so I'm not defining anything directly on the class anymore. It's actually getting defined on, uh, this is called, the syntax for creating modules called the anonymous module because it's, it's not named like time attribute methods. It's just an anonymous module. module. So this should work, right? Like, if it has some place from the class to look in the ancestry to find that method, then it's actually going to find it, right? So, spoiler alert, yes, it worked. Um, awesome. So what it's doing is, if you look at the ancestors of the Alarm Event class, we have now injected this crazy anonymous module with a memory address. And when we're in the Alarm Event class, in a method and we call super, what it does is it starts looking through the ancestry chain to find if there's uh, anything that defines that method. If it doesn't find it, then it blows up like we saw before, but in this case, it's going to find it on this anonymous module and we're good to go. So now we have superpowers. So the name of the talk actually came true. Um, maybe they're not the superpowers you're hoping for, uh, but I think that's usually how it works. Superpowers. Um, so talk achieved at this point. Like we could stop right here, um, and and that would be totally fine. I actually think that that like this is a pretty good solution, and you know we we knocked out all those bullet points that we had problems with uh, from the beginning for the most part. Um, but as I was using this code, uh, I, I poke around in the code a lot with Cry. So how many people here use Cry? Okay, most people, that's awesome. Pry is awesome. You don't use it? Thank you. Weird. <laughs> okay, she doesn't read me. Um, so in Pry, there's a way that you can find method definitions of things uh, that I use all the time. So when I'm poking around in Pry, I look at classes and I'm like, oh, where is this, where is this coming from? And it started rubbing me the wrong way that I would look at a data point or, or what a, one of the other classes are and I'd see, oh, you know, when I look into this, data point at is coming from some crazy module. Like, what did that come from? I mean, I guess it works, but it's not very helpful in Pry anymore. So it may seem like a, a minor thing, but like the, the way that anonymous modules look in the ancestry is the way that you're going to see it in Pry, and uh, it's, it's not exactly programmer friendly. So. There's another thing in Pry called, I think, show source, but the dollar sign is the alias for that in Pry. So you can find out what the definition actually is and what file it came from. So you can actually dig into this a little bit and figure out, okay, this was defined in time attribute methods. I can figure out, you know, really what this is coming from. So, but that's a little bit annoying to me to have to do that level of digging in order to figure this out. So. I wanted to take one last pass at this to make this as friendly as possible for people to use so that people in the future uh, don't hate me for using metaprogramming. And uh, when I say people in the future, it's probably just going to be me in six months, but that's okay. I, I forget things very quickly. So I came across this blog post uh, by, uh, it, it was a guy actually who, who tweeted about uh, how the Ruby object model and, and metaprogramming is one of the best things about Ruby. So Chris Salzberg, he wrote this blog post called The Module Builder Pattern. And it's pointing out a pattern in Ruby uh, that's used a little bit in Rails, uh, a lot in dry RB, if you've ever heard of those projects. Uh, it's used in his own uh, translation gen called Mobility. Uh, and the way that this pattern works is if you define a subclass of module, 
Okay, weird. Uh, you define an initializer to take configuration options. And then you use that configuration inside the initializer in order to define methods. And what that looks like uh, in our case would be like this. I, I decided this is the route I'm going to go. I'm going to see how this works out. So first we define time attribute, uh, which extends module. Um, this may be kind of surprising. I know this isn't the usual way that people think of modules, but module is a class in Ruby. You can extend module, which is, if it helps you to think about it, it's a way of saying that this is a kind of module, like this is a specialization of a module. And so here we have our initializer that takes some configuration options, uh, the attribute to define and the attribute where it comes from. And then just like before, we define our method here within uh, this module builder. And what that gives us is the ability to completely change the implementation of the time attributes method, time reader, to all it does now is include time attribute that new attribute from. So arguably at this point you don't really even need this time reader method. Uh, if you are comfortable enough with module builders in your code, you could directly include time attribute that new attribute from in your data point class and you wouldn't need this extra layer of indirection. But I do realize that this is a pattern that maybe not a lot of people have seen, so wrapping it might be kind of nice. So I left it in there. So now when you look uh, at the ancestry or the ancestors of data point, you'll see that instead of this weird anonymous module, now you have a time attribute module. So that's kind of cool. That's definitely like going in the right direction. It's hinting at what this thing is that's defining. You can look up time attributes in your code and find it way easier than you can look up an anonymous module. Like you just can't search on that. Uh, but I did notice that there's still that weird memory address and like I, now that we have this uh, module class to work with, we can actually define uh, a nice inspect method on it, which will give us even more information uh, to make this as user friendly as possible. So I define the inspect method to um, say what the class name is and what the attribute is and what the attribute is coming from. So now, when you look at the ancestors for data point, you see time attribute, you can see the configuration options of that module. And so you can actually understand right there from uh, Pry exactly how this attribute came to be and how it was defined. And I thought that this is uh, much nicer for folks and hopefully they won't have to dig too far into the code to figure out what it's doing. Um, this is this is the final form. So I think this definitely uh, gave people using this code a, a much better foothold into understanding what was going on. Uh, and I saved the last tweet, or I saved the best tweet for last. I, I got this response and I just couldn't resist sharing it or whatever. So this guy says, meta programming will set your house on fire 60% of the time all of the time. So I hope with some of the things that I showed you in how to approach metaprogramming here and how to write metaprogramming code that enables you to still use Ruby as you normally would, um, including being able to access uh, super potentially, hopefully this is only going to set your house on fire like 80% of the time. Or wait, should it be 40%? Which direction should that go? Anyway, it should be going in the right direction. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and that uh, has been my talk about meta programming with Supercast. Questions? Questions? In the back? Quick question. Obvious question. Okay. So if, my favorite questions. If I am an arson and want to set my house on fire 100% of the time, <laughs> Fire is good. Net program is good. 
is there any way that this could be turned into a Ruby gem? And then make it easy for people to embed a program safely. That's an interesting idea. I haven't thought about that too much. So, so the question is about like if there is a way to turn this approach into a gem that makes it easier to embed a program safely. And I think you know potentially there might be something there. Um, I don't know. I, I also. Like on, on the flip side of that idea, I think I would like for more people to be comfortable with using Ruby and being able to do the metaprogramming directly in Ruby without having an extra layer of a library on top of it. Um, but I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I haven't thought of it too much. It's probably possible. I mean, it's Ruby. <laughs> more questions? Yes. Um, I, I, this is a poorly thought out question. How do you, uh, both as the person who, who did the writing of that code, but also as a as a reviewer, as a reviewer, how do you approach code review um, for a PR that is heavily metaprogrammed? How do you approach code review for PRs that are heavily metaprogrammed? So it's kind of funny. You should say that. So, like, one of the first times I used this module builder pattern, um, I definitely I got the feedback. I, I so what I did as the the developer is I actually wrote a lot of code comments in the uh, module builder file explaining how it worked and referencing that blog post and stuff like that. Um, which, if you're if you're doing meta programming, uh, whether you think the code is self evident or not, I definitely encourage you to document. The, the crap out of it because that's going to help people uh, when they stumble across it in the code. Um, so I think that helped, but I still got the feedback, like, I don't know what the hell is going on here, and can you please explain this to us? Uh, and so that was actually the genesis of me writing a different talk about the module builder pattern. <laughs> uh, so that's how I solved that, is I, I gave a talk about what the hell I'm doing. Um, <laughs> But it, it is a relatively newly coined pattern, and it's not like I don't think people have stumbled across that one a lot yet. Um, but I'm trying to spread the word a little bit about it to to make it more familiar for folks. Yeah, playing off of Miles's question, dealing with process to make sure you've got reasonable quality code, and also playing off of your experience, how do you write a test for this? Oh, uh, actually, writing tests for this is. I think fairly easy. So um, this is actually one of the advantages of using metaprogramming for, for writing these methods, is that you can cover this uh, module builder thing with tests, and then anytime you use it, like you don't have to test that in the code anymore. Right. And, and the way that you would write tests around it is, um, maybe it requires a little bit of extra metaprogramming, but you, <laughs> in, in your code, you uh, like in your example block, you use an anonymous class that includes uh, that module builder, and then you can assert the behavior on that class. Um, so yeah, I was wondering how you would test the module, not necessarily test the the output, the aftermath, but the actual module builder itself. And if you're doing that with an anonymous class, I suppose that would work. Yeah, um, I definitely suggest kind of more of an, like treating it a little bit as a black box like you don't need to know what's going on under the covers of that module builder like if you can assert the the behavior that you're expecting um like not knowing like imagining that you don't even know how it works okay. uh, then that's kind of the best approach i think it's a good approach to testing in general kind of but it's it's hard to put yourself in that mindset of not knowing the implementation especially if you're not doing tdd Oh, time's up. <laughs> all right, well, if anybody has any other questions, come and ask me. If you're interested at all in Stitch Fix, happy to talk about that. If you want to talk about RSpec, happy to talk about that. Um, yeah, that's my talk. <laughs>